Hello and welcome to Newcastle University Business School's podcast series for Women's Entrepreneurship Week. My name is Nicola Patterson and I'm Senior Lecturer in the Leadership Development and Organisation Futures team here at the Business School. I'm joined today by Louisa Rogers from Trendlister. Hi Louise. Hi. Thanks so much for coming along today to share your experiences. Thank you for having um, me. Yeah, thanks. So could you just tell the listeners a little bit about what your name is and where you come from and the, your business? Yeah, absolutely. Um, my name is Louisa Rogers. Um, I'm from Brussels originally, so I was born in Brussels, um, but I'm half English, as you can tell from my accent, and I'm half German. Um, I ended up coming to the UK to study. I went to London initially. I thought I wanted to kind of do fashion photography. So I went to the London College of Fashion um, and I did a course on fashion photography and styling. And then that didn't necessarily match up to my expectations. And that's how I kind of went a bit left of field and started looking into arts administration, the creative and cultural industries. And that's what led me to the masters at the business school, um, which is how I came to Newcastle, which was the arts business and creativity MA program. Oh, fantastic. So uh, from there, what was it that was the inspiration behind Trendlister then? So I had always been buying and selling. Um, so when I was in Brussels, I worked as a photographer because again, that's sort of what I initially wanted to do. And I kind of found a little niche market because I was English speaking and French speaking. Um, I actually did, for example, all the proms for the European schools, the international schools, um, the private schools where they had sort of English speaking students because um, they wanted a photographer that was English speaking native, um, which at the time didn't really feel like it was entrepreneurial because no one had ever mentioned it or talked about it in that way um, and it's only looking back where I think okay I've always kind of had that within me when I came to London I very soon realized that the course that I was doing wasn't really matching up with what I wanted um, what my expectations were and so um, to be honest I more or less just stopped going um, and at that point I started um, sourcing items around London because it's such a kind of fertile ground for doing that and just selling them online. So really simple, just buying and selling, um, mainly focusing on vintage pieces, but also on designer items. And then um, I was doing that for a couple of years. And then, like I say, I ended up applying to the MA in Newcastle and being accepted. And when I came here, I started having conversations with my tutors around what I might want to do in future. And it was really interesting because I had never thought about starting a business and um, setting up a business, even though I had done these sort of little sidelines um, next to my degree work. And when I came here, they started talking about it in such a such an accessible way. You know, I always felt that, you know, I didn't have a, a business qualification and um, I didn't have you know, entrepreneurs in the family, you know, to me, it was always something that someone else would do. And so um, the language and the attitudes shifted around that when I came here and it, it was very much presented as a viable option, as a preferable option in many ways. So that was really interesting. So I started having those conversations with my lecturers and I ended up um, applying for the Founderships Grant, which was available through the startup scheme. And I kind of took what I was already doing, which was the buying and selling of the clothes on a very sort of small scale, um, sort of month to month basis and expanding that into a marketplace concept. So that was my original idea. What I wanted to do was create a space online for curated vintage clothes for people who weren't necessarily vintage shoppers. So people that wouldn't want to go into a charity shop or go and rummage in a car boot sale. I wanted them to have a space online where everything would already pre-selected and um, pre-sorted, you know, styled in a really nice wearable way and kind of make secondhand clothing more accessible in that respect. So that was the original concept for Trendlister that I then pitched and ended up winning or granting the founderships um money for so yeah i'm really interested in the when you talk about the the shift in the language and how accessible and kind of basically how it became a preferred not just a possible career option a preferred option can you give me an example of of that of that use of language or that shift yeah, I think um, it was even just as simple as, um, you know, after a lecture sort of catching up with one of the tutors and, you know, them sort of saying, you know, well, what, what have you done today towards your business and I was going, oh, well, it's not really a business because, you know, they knew that I was doing it on the side so they were aware of that 
And, uh, you know, even just the fact that they would refer to it as my, my business, you know, rather than, oh, your little sideline or your, you know, your hobby. Um, a lot of people would, would call it a hobby at that point because it was only, you know, a couple of hundred quid here and there, you know, um, to help tide me over. So I think them first of all taking an active interest in what I was doing outside of the lessons actually wanting to help with that that gave it a degree of legitimacy um, and I think that shouldn't be underestimated because when someone who's in a position of authority who you know has you know knowledge in that area in that field is kind of referring to it in that way that's actually quite powerful when you yourself have never thought of it in that respect um, so that was really meaningful to me and it, it helped me to boost my confidence and I say to this day the master's was fantastic and I learned a lot but I think what I took away from it the most in terms of value was actually those conversations outside of the lectures um, with my tutors you know about um, my future and my plans and you know I, I really had the sense that they were invested in what I was doing and I've had an ongoing relationship with the university since then that's really proven that as well so yeah, yeah. yeah well, that's fantastic that relationship with, with we're maintaining it now <laughs> absolutely yeah, yeah. but the, the power of relationships I think is is really really important and it's great to hear that obviously your tutors were a great inspiration to kind of motivate and continue and legitimize what you're doing yeah. but is there any body or you know anything in particular that continues to inspire you to kind of on those days where you just think oh you know not quite feeling on top of things um that really kind of helps you pull your socks up and continue and keep going um i, d I don't know if there's any one particular person um I think the world of fashion is really interesting because it's evolving at such a huge pace. And I think the kind of growing movement within fashion, the growing um, sort of tendency towards a more sustainable, sustainability is now not just a trend in fashion, it's almost like a paradigm. So it's almost like um, a frame and everything we kind of do and teach and kind of practice is now starting to take place more and more within that and I think that's quite inspirational and that that's quite an interesting attitude shift um cultural shift and actually kind of consumer behavior shift that we've only started to see in the past year or two and I think when things feel like they're getting um slow you know it, it's been a difficult year I think with the uncertainty around Brexit impacting a lot of retail um and fashion is definitely a, a big part of that as well I think I try and um put things into perspective by remembering that we are right at the beginning still of this major shift in the way in our relationships towards fashion and towards the way that we consume fashion and you know hopefully I'm positioning myself in a good place for when that does eventually tip over into being um, sort of more mainstream. You know, I think it's already happened quite a lot with vintage, but now moving into things like made to order, um, zero waste and, you know, sort of um, making in the UK, for example. So I, I think not necessarily a person that I look to, but I try and remember that there are the landscape is changing, you know, and, and hopefully I can be a player in that, you know, even when times get a bit tough on the uh, on the old sales front. Yeah, yeah, because actually when time, well, times are always changing and trends are always changing and evolving. So how do you manage, keep up with that within the business? Oh, I mean, I think I'm very lucky in that I think I mentioned to you, I'm doing some lecturing work now um, and that's sort of, sort of my day job, shall we say, but it, it does feed in really nicely to the business because it actually forces me to keep up with these things, you know, through the briefs that we write, um, through the material that we teach and actually just being around younger consumers and kind of listening to their concerns, um, understanding their habits. That's kind of a really good way of staying up to date with things you know when you don't have time to read every single article off the business of fashion um so i'm quite lucky in that my day job supplements and it kind of has a symbiotic relationship with my business practice as well yeah that's great so um what what's been your proudest moment to date with trendlister oh proudest moment well, I was very, very proud um, to be asked to come and speak actually at this university for the International Women's Day event last year. Um, 
because I was speaking alongside some extremely impressive uh, qualified uh, women. Um, so I think we had uh, the director of the Port of Tyne and we had um, Amy, who's professor. Amy Stabler? Yes, yes, yep, yes. Yep, yep. Um, so that that was really lovely to actually be sort of speaking alongside on the same platform as women who, you know, were much further along in their careers and had achieved so much. Um, so that was really, really like a lovely moment. Um, and I suppose um, the other sort of proud moment I had was being profiled in the Northeast Times. Oh, what a fantastic, <laughs> So yeah. that was great. Um, the Northeast Times uh, is a really beautifully made magazine. I love the creative direction of it. And when they contacted me and they said, you know, we'd like to do some editorial on you, that was fantastic. Cause I know that they have a strong advertorial side as well. So the fact that they wanted to come and dedicate, you know, a six page spread to me and my little business, um, that was a really, really fantastic moment and one that I'm very proud of. So where next for Trendlister? So at the moment, um, it's quite exciting. I'm actually um, moving away from vintage um, and into something that is um, probably more in the made to order sphere in terms of clothing. So looking at one of the next big trends happening in fashion, um, vintage has sort of reached almost a saturation point. Um, so now I'm designing a range of items, taking vintage silhouettes, uh, vintage details, vintage textiles, and actually remaking them for modern wear. So um, we would take, for example, the shape of a 1970s dress, make some alterations, you know, maybe cut off a sleeve, change the hemline, maybe add something, maybe take something away. And then we make it in a broad range of sizes, obviously to make it more accessible because, you know, vintage sizing is often runs very, very petite. Um, and the other thing that can be frustrating with vintage clothes is a lot of the fabrics are very difficult. So, you know, they're dry clean only or hand wash or very delicate. So kind of trying to take that lovely vintage style that's very unique, very unusual and creating garments that are, um, you know, size accessible, but also easy to throw in the washing machine, you know, hang out to dry that, you know, you can just go, you can wear um, day to day and the way that we're doing that is through made to order so it's a zero waste process um, we sample any textile waste that we produce during the sampling process um, gets upcycled so uh, one thing that we've done with them that was really nice was we actually covered notebooks in them that was oh, really lovely, lovely. and yeah. then we use the notebooks as kind of promotional handouts um, we also make sort of hair bands scrunchies things like that um, so that's kind of another way of out of the sampling process, just kind of helping to alleviate that waste problem. But then the idea is, you know, that consumers nowadays are more happy to invest in something if they feel it's made to order. Mm -hmm. um, we do our pattern cutting in Gateshead, we do our sampling in Gosforth, and we do our production in the centre of Newcastle. So it's, yeah, yeah it's a very, a very local, yeah. yeah, local operation. And I think that's... Um, you know, Brexit will necessitate that sort of thing more and more, but also um, it's it's lovely for us because it means we're cutting down on carbon emissions and, you know, we can ensure the, the working conditions of the people that are contributing to Trendlister um, as a project. So that's kind of what's next now. So some garments are ready to go. Some garments are still in the sampling process and then um, hopefully moving to a new premises in the middle of this month and uh, launching the website with the made-to-order in-house range. So, yeah, it's quite, going quite on exciting. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Really but exciting. All yeah. good things, I hope. So, um, to kind of end and close, I just wanted to ask what would be the be the one piece of advice that you would give another woman who would be thinking about setting up a business, particular within, within the sector that you're based within fashion? I think um, I think my one piece of advice would be that a lot of the businesses that survive aren't necessarily um, the best ideas. You know, um, I think a lot of it is simply about resilience. I think a lot of people will um, put some time into a project and feel if they're not seeing that payoff straight away, you know, it, it becomes very easy to sort of abandon it or to say, well, it's a bad idea, so I'm not going to kind of follow through with it. So I would say, um, you know, that 
things do take time to build momentum. And I think sometimes very instantaneous kind of world, we forget that. And also I would say, don't be too precious about your idea and don't be um, worried about failing. So my original idea I thought was great. I thought I had this, you know, fantastic sort of gap in the market identified. And through a combination of factors, it didn't work out. Um, You know, some external, you know, some were more mistakes that I had made. It doesn't mean that that was the end of Trendlister. It just means that I had to adapt and change and evolve. And that's normal for a small business. And that's normal in your first few years. Um, And to just not be afraid. And actually, you know, it all just adds to the story. And um, there's no uh, job that I could have done straight out of university that has taught me as much as setting up a small business has. So, you know, try and reframe everything as a positive learning experience. And it's such a cliche, but it's absolutely true. So just don't be afraid of making mistakes. You know, everyone does it. It's just about adapting and responding to them in the best way that you can. That's a great piece of advice. Thank you. Thank you, (laughs) Louisa. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Sharing your experiences. Thank Thank you. you.